So who is Michael Boyle? According to Body by Boyle, Michael is one of the most foremost experts in the field of strength and conditioning, functional training, and general fitness. He currently spends his time lecturing, teaching, training, and writing. So he's published the book called uh, you know, functional, or functional Training for Sports by Human Kinetics. Uh, prior to co-funding Michael Boyle Strength and Conditioning, Michael served at the head, and, uh, head strength and conditioning coach at Boston University for 15 years. Also, for the past 25 years, he has been the strength and conditioning coach for men's hockey at Boston University. Okay, Mike was also was the Boston Red Sox strength and conditioning coach in 2013 that won the World Series. In addition to his duties at Boston University and the Red Sox from 91 to 99, Boyle served as a strength and conditioning coach for the Boston Bruins of the National Hockey League. Mike was also strength and conditioning coach for the 1998 U.S. Women's Olympic Hockey Team, gold medalist in Nagano, and 2014 silver medalist in Sochi, and served as a consultant in the development of the USA Hockey National Team Development Program in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So why am I getting this information? Where am I getting this information from? This is who and why, right? He has the background. He's worked with Olympic athletes. If you're going to coach athletes, who are you going to get your information from to coach them the right way when it comes to strength training? Yourself? Are you going to make? Are you going to go to Instagram, scroll through, pick out the, your favorite exercises, and, and use them with your players? Or are you going to get information from somebody who has Olympic, uh, obviously an Olympic pedigree? Uh, collegiate pedigree and professional baseball and hockey pedigree. You can't really beat this type of, of evidence and proof as far as strength training goes. We're going to talk more about that as we go along. So human kinetics is one of the most, is one of the best publishers in human science. Asked Michael to create a book for training athletes. So they asked him to write this book. Okay, they knew they knew he knew what he was doing. They know he's a functional train, strength coach. They asked him to write this book for sports. It's a relatively cheap book. It's only about twenty something bucks. You can probably get it cheaper. I definitely recommend picking it up. And I'm not getting paid, or I'm not getting any payments to say any of that. Um, uh, there's lots of videos, and if you get certified. If you don't get certified, this book is a must. So if you don't get certified functional strength and conditioning coach, this is a must. So you obviously have an opportunity to get NCSF certified if you'd like for personal training. You could also go this route, CFSC, okay? But this is typically for people that are gonna be working with primarily athletes. But if you're into training, you can also get it as well. So function equals purpose. What is function? If something has a purpose, it has a function. Functional training for sports is like saying purposeful training for sports. What we do in the weight room has a purpose. If not, it is deemed not functional and therefore unsafe or not relevant to what the athlete is trying to attain. A strength coach must be able to decipher good from bad exercises in the same way they will correct form. Understanding the function or purpose of an exercise will allow you to make better decisions when you when selecting exercise program for teams and individuals. So if you understand what functional training is, then you're gonna understand how to train your athletes. So functional training for sports came from sports medicine. So where did functional training come from? These doctors prescribe specific and safe exercises for their patients to perform to bring them back to their current condition. These exercises were deemed functional because they had a purpose to improve tissue quality the exercise used to return an athlete to health might also be the best exercises to maintain and improve health. The injury process is you have rehab, you go through physical therapy, then you go through athletic training rooms, then you hit the weight room, okay? Functional range conditioning, we've talked about that. That's a system of mobility. So we learned previously about FRC. How does this play out in the process? How, why am I bringing this up into this recovery process because injury happens, we rehab the injury, we have physical therapy, FRC 
is another way to prepare the athlete before the weight room. Why? FRC is a mobility development system that prescribes specific exercises for the specific joint to not only get back to current conditions, but to also have a buffer. So the goal of FRC isn't just to get you back to your current conditions, like sports medicine does, but to get you in a position to be better at what you were doing previously. Because if you get yourself into the position that you were in previously, then you're gonna have the same injury, right? You wanna get better than that position. If, if I have a right ankle issue, I don't wanna get it to just back to where it was because then I'll have another ankle. I have to get that ankle actually stronger. So the FRC, the mobility development is for those specific injuries. Now the strength training and functional uh, training that we are getting into, um, we'll talk a little bit why they're, they're different and, and how you might be able to use both. So most rehab programs will get the athlete back to condition they were in before. The purpose of mobility training is to exceed those conditions because if those were those conditions, because those were the conditions that led to the injury. We can't prevent injuries, but we can mitigate them through functional training and functional range conditioning. Okay, so Michael Boyle does not endorse or promote FRC, although he does have the same, uh, uh, he has the same um, outlook for training as functional range conditioning. So that's why I really like both of these systems together because he would approve of mobility development and has approved of some of the uh, exercises in FRC and has actually utilized some of the 990 uh, movements and some of the FRC movements in his program, but he doesn't specifically call it functional range conditioning, okay? <clears throat> so what about sport specific exercise or sport specific training? So you've heard people say, oh, I'm a sport specific trainer and we do all this stuff on a med ball, we gotta do all of our stuff on a, a BOSU ball and I'm gonna throw tennis balls at you and we're gonna call that sport specific training. And you see all these random exercises on the internet of people, you know, someone will be running on a treadmill and you have two people pushing that person while they're running on that, you know, sport specific exercises or, you know, they'll try to um, be in the weight room with a basketball lifting a weight and they're calling this sport specific because you're you're involving the sport while you're training. So these teams are mislabeled and misused. Terms such as sport specific implies that certain movements are specific to individual sport. Sport specific training actually occurs on the mat field or court, whereas in strength and conditioning, we work to get stronger and to improve specific conditioning. So basically sport specific training is the actual sport on the field at that time. So working on a corner kick is sport specific training. It's not training in the gym with sport. So a lot of people and even trainers and college strength coaches, they get this mixed up and they try to reinvent the wheel themselves. And then they do all fancy exercises that aren't functional, like safe, you know, going on a, uh, a exercise ball on your knees and doing the battle ropes, right? High risk for injury. Is it functional? No, why? Because it's high risk of injury. Why, why is that not functional? Because we don't want to injure our athletes, right? Same thing with a back spot. You're going to load the spine, possibly with someone who hasn't loaded their spine before, and you're going to tell them that they need to master the back spot and get as heavy back spot by the end of the year as possible or basically the team is gonna laugh at them, right? Because if, if you don't have a good back squat in baseball, you might get made fun of. And that's just the way of the, the strength and conditioning world will make you feel, right? You feel intimidated not to do a back squat. Everyone's doing a back squat and it's in the, in the program. So it all starts with the strength coach and what they program in and why they think that's appropriate. So we'll talk more about that as well. Most sports possess far more similarities than differences. So you don't really need to train, you don't need to train a soccer and hockey player that much different. They're both gonna work on speed, yes. Do hockey players do more cuts and lateral movements? Yes, but hey, don't, don't soccer players do that? Don't lacrosse, you know? So I mean, you're gonna see a lot of the same forward and side to side action, tennis, side to side, up and down, soccer, forward, up side to side. So, I mean, you're going to see that in a lot of those, those sports. 
Excellent side is sprinting, jumping, striking, moving laterally. These are all similarities in sport. Speed training for all sports is similar. How do you train for speed? By running 10, meter, 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, right? Maybe 50 yards, but probably not. You know, you're playing soccer, you're probably not gonna do a 50 yard dash that much in a game, right? You might do some 10s, some 20s, some 30s. You might do a couple 40s if you're an offensive player or if you're a midfielder and you're going back and forth. But if you're defense, you shouldn't be really going, you know, 60 yard dashes down the field. So you're gonna focus as a strength coach, lacrosse, soccer, basketball, on those quick and short distance sprints or maybe a moderate uh, longer distance, but program that correctly. So fast is fast, regardless of whether we are trained for American football player or a soccer player. Core training is no different for golf than it is for hockey or tennis. And speed and core training is very little, is very little difference from sport to sport. Functional training looks at commonalities of sport and reinforces them. Michael Boyle, strength and conditioning at a CF, uh, CSFC and Body by Boyle have used similar programs to train Olympic gold medalists and judo in judo and hockey. No matter the sport, similar programs. Strength is strength, speed is speed, functional training, training movements, not muscles, involves simple versions of squatting, forward bending, lunging, pushing, and pulling. And these are the basis of uh, the strength program beside the actual rotation and uh, core program. What is not functional training? Training while seated. So if you're doing seated exercises, seated row, seated, you know, seated things, <clears throat> why? Because in sports, we're not seated, right? Unless you're uh, in a Paralympic sport, right? So leg press, leg curl, bicep machine, seated row would not be functional for most sports that aren't in the Paralympics. Sports are not played in a rigid environment when stability is provided externally. So you're never going to be in an environment in sport where you are placed, sit down in a rigid environment, and then you're getting maybe some external support because you're able to hold on to the machine, right? So you're getting all the stability due to the machine. Whereas in sport, there is no stability. You're, you're, you're not stable in sport. Everything is dynamic. So we want to teach that too. Although in theory, machine-based training may result in fewer injuries. So during training, you might not get injured as much trained safely, right? The lack of proprioceptive input, basically, since there's no internal sensory feedback about the position of movement, you're not having to use your brain that much, vestibular system, that type of thing, and the lack of stabilization will more than likely lead to a greater number of injuries during competitions, but you're not preparing yourself in that environment. So functional training for sport, it prepares athletes for sport. It's not about using one sport to train an athlete for another sport. <clears throat> but we talked about this before. Many collegiate strength programs confuse the two. And as a result, train their athletes to be powerlifters and Olymp Olympic style weightlifters as much as they do to excel in their primary sports. So functional training uses many concepts developed by sport coaches to train speed, strength, and power in order to improve sport performance and reduce incidence of injury. And the key is taking those concepts from the track coach or powerlifting experts and apply them to intelligently to athletes. So we want to apply those same concepts they use in powerlifting, but we want to kind of portray that to our athletes intelligently, not the exact same way. <clears throat> A program should carefully blend concepts and knowledge from areas such as sports medicine therapy, sports performance to create the best possible scenarios for that particular athlete. So you're not just using a personal training approach, strength approach, you're looking at it in a holistic approach here. You're looking at all the different areas. Functional training intentionally incorporates balance and proprioception, body awareness in the training through the use of unilateral exercises. So a lot of the exercises in uh, functional training involve being on one leg because when you're walking, well, when you're moving, you're always on one leg, right? You can't walk with both feet on the ground, right? You have to be walking with two feet, unless you're jumping, right? So train, uh, you know, in a split stance, unilateral, one-legged stance position is what he focuses on. Again, better and gray, 
Say functional training programs need to introduce com controlled amounts of instability so that athletes must react in order to regain their own stability. So for example, when I'm doing a, uh, a plank rotation, if I get in the push-up position, and if I were to reach forward, my body wants to shift. Okay, so I'm trying to control that shift, and I, in order to control that shift, I have to make sure my body does not rotate. So I'm trying to do an anti-rotation exercise here. And my body is also trying not to extend or it will break, right? So I'm actually creating a stable environment, but in a very unstable position to be in. My body wants to move around while I'm in that position. So that would be an example. One leg training would also be an example. <clears throat> So he says the best way to do this is on one leg. Functional training utilizes single leg movements that require balance to properly develop muscles in the way they are used in sport. Simply learning to produce force while under a heavy load and on two feet is, is non-functional for most athletes. So to produce force on two feet like this isn't as beneficial as producing force on one leg, okay? Because you are less stable, okay, here more stable, you can load more, right? You can't load as much here, okay? <clears throat> so you need to first analyze and understand the demands of the sport. Is it aerobic or anaerobic? Obviously, you're not gonna train this way for uh, someone who's in a cardio sport like rowing or swimming. You might have to train a little bit differently, but for most of us, team sports, it's gonna be anaerobic, okay? Most sports are endurance sports or speed and power sports. Gymnastics, ragged sports, and figure skating are speed and power sports. Usually the best players or top performers are not the most flexible or the one with the most endurance. It's typically the individual who has the most power and speed, okay? Matching type of sport and types of tests. So this was the old approach. Test the athletes, analyze the test, and draw a conclusion. He believes this is flawed because power athletes perform worse on VO2 testing. These tests would determine that these athletes are unfit. And since athletes in sports are primarily fast twitch, use fast twitch muscles and explosive movements, generally perform poorly on tests of aerobic capacity. So typically your power and strength athletes, your best athletes aren't gonna perform as well on a VO2 max test so a lot of times you see people test VO2 as a way to determine um, capacity, but sometimes that might not be the best thing because then after that, you're gonna try to get that player to get their VO2 up by telling them to do more cardio and that might cause overuse injuries, okay? So we may cause overuse injuries in these athletes if aerobic conditioning program is programmed into their training and it's easier to make a sprinter into an endurance athlete, but it's seldom a desirable result. So we don't want to turn one of our fastest, most powerful, most explosive player on the field into less explosive by training more aerobic training into their program. So example, a soccer match is actually a series of sprints, jogs, and walks that occur over two hours. Any athlete can run five miles in two hours, in fact, Five miles in two hours is 2.5 miles per hour. So on average, you're only going 2.5 miles an hour on a soccer field, okay? That is a very slow play, uh, pace. So most soccer players need to learn how to accelerate and decelerate. That's what they're doing, accelerating, decelerating. Tennis, hockey, um, lacrosse, right? Um, most soccer players need to, uh, so this takes strength, power, and speed. Will they develop this in five mile runs? Probably not. Football, in football, an athlete generally runs 10 yards or less and the play takes about five seconds. There's almost 40 seconds of rest between plays. So how should you condition for these athletes? Probably with short sprints and 30 to 40 second rest, right? This is the key when analyzing for sport. Watch the game, watch the best players, look for those common denominators. So look, is there sprinting or jumping? If so, lower body strength is critical, particularly unilateral training. Are there frequent start and stops? How long is the play? 
Are the players in the field the whole time? If yes, how often do they sprint and how often do they jog? Does an athlete's speed and power place her at the top 10% of the athlete's sport? These are all questions you can ask yourself as a strength coach for a team. So assessment and functional training. He only looks at these when he's assessing his players. He doesn't do a sit-up test. Okay, he doesn't do a forearm plank test to see how long you can do a plank for. Um, he doesn't even put those in his programs. He doesn't have athletes go into a forearm plank for more than 20 seconds he does, or 30 seconds. He doesn't even believe it's necessary. Okay, um, take a break, go back into it, but he doesn't believe that's actually going to do that much. He thinks it's a waste of time if that's how you're training athletes. Let's just see how long we can do planks for. Okay. So he does maximum number of chin-ups or pull-ups because that primarily uses the ATP, CP system. So he's looking at your explosive power and strength here. Okay, and how many pull-ups or chin-ups you can do is definitely a measure of how strong you are. Because if you can't pull yourself up functionally, if you were on a cliff, think, how would you pull yourself up if you were on a cliff? And that's something that is functional and that, that we're all gonna be hanging on cliffs. But it would be nice to know that you can pull yourself out of a bad condition or get yourself up over a fence or a, a wall if you had to one day, if there was an emergency. Maximum number of suspension inverted rows. So that's like holding onto a TRX and do an inverted row. How many of those can you do? You have to use your whole body to do that. It's not just your upper body, your core is involved. Num number and maximum number of push-ups. That's what he'll measure. Rear foot elevated split squat. So this is probably too high, but rear foot elevated split squat looks like this. It's probably half uh, the height of this table. And he has his athletes see how much weight they can hold or carry on their body as they do that. So if you didn't know, you can produce more force on one foot individually than you can develop on both feet at the same time. So basically, when you do a one-legged squat, you'll produce more force than if you were to combine the total from a bilateral squat. And that's called the bilateral deficit. And it's researched and backed up, okay? So you actually can produce more power on one leg. Therefore, training on one leg is important. Um, how you, you probably have to see um, that about part down two-handed that you can have one-handed. Right. And if you watch uh, the series of the uh, the last stance of Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, they're doing split stand squats with dumbbells in their hands. And, you know, that's, that was part of their training. And, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of what Michael Boyle preaches. So that was even part of the, uh, not saying that they were using his training, but they were using some of the methods, one leg training back in the 90s. So um, double leg vertical jump. What is that? What is that going to assess? Okay, yep. Power, right? You power up, but how far can you jump up into the air? How much leg strength can you do you have possess? He looks at these five, and that's basically it. Okay. What's something on there that you think you know would have been on someone else's assessment list? You think you would have seen back squat, maybe. A mile run, right? Yeah, the mile run. So he doesn't do, he doesn't have that. He doesn't, he doesn't care how fast. He, and he's talking about Olympic athletes. His job isn't to condition them aerobically, right? Unless that's their sport. And if that's the case, different training output. But if we're primarily in, in and I'm sure you know, we're going to be working with team sports. Or if we're not working with team sports, we know we need to know how to develop strength and power. Even aerobic sports, we need that. Designing a program. So learn the basics first. Do not load externally until the body can handle internal load. So if I can't perform a split squat, body squat, then don't put a kettlebell in my hand yet until I can do this first without falling over. And I need to look at what. Okay, you don't want to get too. You don't want to get too specific on cues. It should just look the way 
straight down, straight up. Okay, we, we wouldn't want to go like this. This would be a split spot where lean forward like that. That would be too much on the knee, knee sharing there. All the way down, all the way up. Okay, now I'm putting all the leg on that front foot, and the back foot is just for stability. And then I can take that out, and I can do a one legged spot to make it even harder on a box. That'll progress. Okay, so you can progress all of this. So begin with uh, simple body weight exercises. Don't lift too much too soon. If you can't handle body weight, then you may regress with machines or elastic equipment like bands. So if you can't handle body weight, then you may have to regress to machines until you're ready for body weight. Progress from simple to complex. Sample split squat to rear foot elevated. So going from a split squat where both feet are on the ground to bringing my back leg off of the ground and then going to the point where I'm just doing a one-legged squat. Use the concept of progressive resistance, add weight, four reps each week. So continually trying to get more strong by adding reps or weight. Periodization, so very overused term, but he narrows it down and simplifies it for us. Phases of high volume, so you have accumulation, extensive loading, high intensity, intensification, intensive loading, and unloading should be modulated within the program. So going from high volume, high intensity, and unloading programs, what you're doing is you're going from one phase to the next. So you're doing high volume for you know, three to six weeks, then you're going for high intensity, then you're gonna go to Unloading, okay, so you're just changing. So higher volume, lower load periods should be alternated with higher intensity, lower volume periods. So higher volume, lower load. So lower, you know, body weight, okay. Higher volume, meaning higher reps, should be alternated with higher intensity. So harder, stronger, lower volume, lower reps exercises. So this means you have the choice of accumulating volume with three sets of eight, 24 reps, or exercising more intensely with three sets of five reps. So either moderately have 24 reps done or vigorously do 15 reps for each set that you perform. And so that's how you would use periodization. And then going through that, whether it's in your micro, meso, or macro cycle, right? Going through those periodically. You could probably go a couple weeks, three, six weeks, going, you know, higher volume, lower load, and then you might go three to six weeks, um, um, higher intensity, higher load. So exercise classifications he has are baseline progression and regression. So basically for every exercise he teaches, he has a baseline where you need to get to, where you start at. If you're not at that yet, you need to go to PT, you need to get therapy before you go to the baseline. If you're not ready for strength training yet, if you're not at the baseline. So if you're at the baseline, you're at the first exercise. Second is your progression, and then you need to also know the regressions as well. So he classifies his exercise into three different kinds. So you have least functional exercises all the way to most functional. For lower body exercises, he has knee dominant. So for example, a split squat, a goblet squat, knee dominant. One leg RDL, good morning, hip dominant, okay? So your knee dominance from least functional to most functional you have your leg press. So the reason why this is not functional is because you're lying. There's no stabilization by the athlete. You have your machine squat, which would be the next tier. Standing, no stabilization by athlete. Then you have your barbell squat, not functional because you're on two legs. And then you have your rear foot elevated split squat, which would be more functional. One leg, additional balance assistance. And then most functional one leg squat, one leg with no additional balance assistance. So the rear foot elevated is when your back foot is on an object. So it's, and then 
No assistance means that there's nothing there. Okay? So you go on top of a box and do a one-legged squat. I don't want to do that because I'm warm, I'm not warmed up. I don't want to injure yourself. So hip dominant type of exercise, you have your leg curl where you're on your stomach and do your leg curl. Then you have your back extension, your prone functional action. Not sure what he means by that. So you're on your stomach and your back extension is basically when you just extend your back, it seems. Um, two legs, single leg, or Romanian deadlift, okay? That would be going up. And then one leg, single leg deadlift with two dumbbells. So one leg, single leg deadlift with two dumbbells would be next. And then one leg, single leg deadlift with one dumbbell. This would be the most functional for the hip as compared to being on your stomach and just doing leg curls, okay? For upper body, horizontal press, so machine bench press, supine, no stabilization by athlete, bench press, supine, moderate stabilization, dumbbell bench press, supine, single arm stabilization, because you have to work with one arm each for dumbbell. Push-up, prone with closed chain, so just a straight push-up. And then stability ball push-up, prone with additional ch challenge to balance. So putting your feet on top of the ball, that's kind of moving you side to side. Horizontal pull, so from low to high, machine row, dumbbell row, inverted row, one arm, one leg row, and one arm, two leg rotational row. Torso exercises, your crunch would be the least functional, your inline uh, kneeling half lift, your lunge position lift, standing lift, and medicine ball side throw would go into more functional, okay? So I have a link here <coughs> to um, some videos. I have a drive here with some pictures from his book. Um, that you can look at if you'd like to, and it's going to go in depth with those baseline and progression exercises, if it, if it will load here. I'm not sure if it'll load. Okay. I do have a Google Docs. Here's your Michael Boyle podcast. Okay, you'll be looking at one of these podcasts for homework. So you'll be reading or you'll be watching one of these podcasts. Here's his channel. If you want to check out his channel, um, I'll have that link for you there. Doesn't think, don't think things are really loading that well, so I'm not going to go in depth. Okay, and then you have his body by Boyle, his website, and strengthcoach.com. Those are two websites that he basically manages and oversees. Okay, give you a little bit more information. Bodybyboyle.com, strengthcoach.com. He's going to be there, okay? And then I have some YouTube videos that you could also look at as well. I have some on core training, aerobic conditioning debate, so why he doesn't believe aerobic training is that important for athletes or overall population. He doesn't believe that jogging, going for jogging is good for people. He doesn't believe that people should just be jogging. He thinks it's bad for your knees. Now you can debate him and say, oh, I'm a jogger. I'm not going to stop jogging but he'll debate you and say that you're more likely to have knee issues when you get older. So you can go back and forth. Now, he believes that walking is good and running is good and sprinting is good. He just doesn't believe that that jogging is good because most people jog with an improper gait as it is. And jogging is kind of, you know, you're not really, like when you're running, your body has intent when you're jogging your body doesn't have intent, so it's more likely to lose track, right? You know, a lot of times, too, people jog on the road. Mm -hmm. and that's like one of the worst things to do because you've got that little bit of, um, of incline that the water will go to the side. Yeah, well, I mean, every time I road train and run and sprint on the road, I have the worst issues with my ankles and shins after. But if I run on grass, it's a totally different story. I mean, and on sand too. So I think barefoot, right? I think barefoot training is good, like on sand and on grass. 
I don't think um, bare tr barefoot training is good on uh, concrete. Issue. On concrete, but like with on mats and, and surfaces that give you a little give, I think barefoot training is really important. And I think he talks a lot about barefoot training as well. But um, you obviously need to wear shoes when you're training in sports. You're not going to go out on the field and, and train without your cleats or your ice skates on. So that wouldn't be something to do. So that's a little bit about Michael Boyle. Um,